Are you deaf, bud, or are uh, we okay? <laughs> you know, I'm going to make it. How, how deaf is you? We going to be all right. <laughs> uh, my earballs is fine. What's up, y'all? It's the What If Podcast. Hey there. Hi, Spencer. Hi. Happy day. <laughs> Happy release of the new episode day. Thanks, bro. <laughs> We're time traveling again. Dun 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 dun. Yeah, we play jack jams when we put out new episodes now. Uh, I was gonna say when we time travel. Oh, okay. That's our hype tra- that's our hype track for traveling through. We've time. gotten our lives together and no longer record like three minutes before these episodes come out. Although you know, maybe there's um maybe there's value to that. Maybe we'll find that if we record in advance. Very important alien and or space and or scary and or psychology things will happen mm. the day of and we'll be like, shit, we're behind. We have to. Or like maybe one of us will see a cool movie in between. Maybe. And maybe we'll talk about it maybe. next week. Maybe. It's possible. Maybe one of us will throw a shoe at Bob Lazar between now and the time <laughs> the episode comes out. Who knows? Anything's possible. <laughs> Anything is possible. <laughs> Uh, we haven't played any voicemails in a while. You want to play a couple of voicemails? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got a really long one from Bear. Hello, what up, Bear? Bear. We're not going to play your whole voicemail, but we hear you. Actually, you are appreciated. You are appreciated. I, I should say this really quickly. We got like 30 voicemails in the last <laughs> week. We can't play all of y'all's voicemails. We're sorry. We love you and we appreciate you. And some of them are like kind of personal and then sometimes we don't play those. So just so you know, with with email, we can respond to you and say, thank you for hollering. We love you too. But with voicemails, that's a little harder. So, But also we do listen to literally all of them. 100% of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, 612 246 4 Six one four. If you want to call and leave us and, a voicemail, and know that, that even if it doesn't get played on the show, we have listened to it together and laughed about it. Yes, and we love you. And l- laughed at Google's transcriptions of your guys's greetings, mm-hmm. like when Bear says "Morning, boys." This is Bear. Translation or the transcription says "Morning, Boris." This is Bert. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Mm-hmm. Shitty robots. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, it's close enough. C- sort of. Sort of. All right. Uh, let's try this one. This is from Pete in Wisconsin, or that pizza from Wisconsin, according to Google. Thanks, Google. You're so helpful. <laughs> hey, boys. It's pissed off Pete Wisconsin calling you. Maybe what up, Pete? More pissed off after that Vikings Packers game, but oh well. Hey, oh, got it. Sports. I, tell you, I finally did it. I finally subscribed to your Patreon. Let's go. I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> And you guys should feel honored because I am like the cheapest bastard in the world. <laughs> And I like free stuff. And so I uh, finally did subscribe because I can't miss any of your shows. So That's what's you're only one of four that I subscribe to, so you should feel honored. All right? Love you. Keep up the good work. Bye-bye. Hey, love you too, pissed off, Pete. We'll feel however you want us to feel for just five bucks a month. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hey, speaking of the Patreon, th- thank you, Pete, for joining. Uh, and also, mega thank you to the shitload of people that joined the past week as well. Uh, Patreon.com slash what if podcast if you want to get double the amount of episodes. Uh, we do two episodes every week. You are hearing one of the two. The uh, second one is over there on patreon.com slash what a podcast. I was watching a, uh, Nat Geo documentary today about DB Cooper. Sick. <laughs> and y'all, we, we really do this. Okay. <laughs> you know, this episode is not about DB Cooper. We really do this. Yeah. And, uh, my wife walked by and she's like, what are you watching and why? And it was w- while they were doing like some horrible low budget reenactment mm. of dude parachuting out, out the back steps of the plane. Dope. And I was like, oh, it's a DB Cooper thing. She's like, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> and, and she's like, when are you guys, uh, when are you guys going to get enough Patreon money that you can start doing shitty reenactments of the, of oh, the nonsense that you talk about on the podcast? Not soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> not soon enough. <laughs> Oh so, my god. Patreon.com slash what if podcast. What I would really love need is to up our reenactment budget. Big time. What I'd really love is if we could get someone who's an animator, like a cartoonist. Mm. And they don't have to be like great, just enough to like create short form cartoons. Right. <laughs> Animated versions of the joke like rabbit holes we go down off of some of these stories could be pretty phenomenal. Yeah. All right. If you are an animator and don't like money, but do <laughs> like having fun and making jokes, hi at What If Podcast. Warrior guys. Uh, were there any other voicemails you wanted to get to? Um, 
I don't know. Should I we, already forgot. I, I feel good about saying thanks to Pissed Off Pete and tell them folks uh, they can get more of the show if they like the show, and thanks Bet. for everyone for joining. Bet. Um, Do you want to listen to the three-minute-long silent one that somebody left us? <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to take a moment to center ourselves before we embark on today's episode, like bro. John Cage song. I'm going to go ahead and just grab all my chakras and put them in <laughs> one basket with that basket balanced on top of my head, man. I like this uh, surfer chakra guy character you're, you're workshopping here. Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Soup's chill, man. So we're doing the thing where uh, we thought it was going to be a one-parter, then it became a two-parter, and now it's a three-parter. Oops. But with very different stories. Yeah, we're talking about the concept of isolation one more time, but with a very, very different story from our first two and um, for what it's worth, this was on my list of things to talk about for the very first uh, part one of this uh, train of episodes, and uh, we didn't cover it because we had so much to cover on our other shit, so we decided to save it for its own full episode uh, in a very full part three. Yeah. So here we are, uh, here we are today talking about the Lykov family. Uh, I'm going to let you tell the, the main story because last time I, I went a little off the rails and talked for like 50 minutes out of the hour long episode. <laughs> so you, you should start today. The funny part was this last week's episode was my idea and Spencer were like, he <laughs> yeah, I got this. Okay. No, he, wait, 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 wait. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. He liked it and he found his way and I was like, yeah, no, he's got it. No, he's got it. He gets it. So you, you had it down, man. It's all, right. all good. Well, this week it's your turn. All right, so we I'll are just going to interject with some stupidity from time to time. No, no, no. You, you, you know the story too. We can, we can co-tell. Um, we're going to talk about the Lykov family. So uh, the Lykov family was a family of uh, old believers uh, or old ritualists, if you will, who departed. That's a religion, by the way, yeah. or like a, a denomination yeah. of. What is it? Russian Russian Orthodox there Christianity. There it is. So basically the old believers, there was some reform occurring in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, they disagreed with the reforms that were happening. Joseph Stalin was coming into power and persecuting uh, old believer Christians. I believe the Bolsheviks were the ones that were persecuting the old believer Christians. Sure. Um, it was... It, beards were taxable, so I'd have been fucked. What, come again? Uh, it was part of the old believers' religion to have facial hair on the men. It's like part of, mm -hmm. you know, in lots of uh, more orthodox religions, there's facial hair and ways you wear your hair or cover your hair, all that stuff. Yeah. Familiar with the idea of facial hair? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, the, <laughs> the religious law of styling your hair in specific right. the, ways. The tax part was where my question... Yeah, yeah. No, so um, apparently in, a, in an effort to uh, dissuade people from wearing their facial hair in such ways, having a beard was a taxable thing to, mm. to have on your face. Wow. Because they were like, stop being so religious, bro. We need to, we need to join the 21st mm. century. Show off that pretty face. It was or not the twenty first century. Fine. It really was, um, and it was, and it was expensive. And if you if you didn't pay your taxable beard fine, you would be forcibly shaved. Wow. Yeah, it got kind of fucked up. Forcible shaving sounds terrible and kind of dangerous. Yeah, so fucked up that um, his head fell off. Well, kind of actually. <laughs> <laughs> Karp Lykov uh, was working. Um, I believe he was some sort of like manual laborer i don't actually underst beard shaver. understand what his job was no no he had a beard um but his brother was murdered by a bolshevik patrol uh what basically next to him while he was working so he just because, because um fuck old believers i guess okay i don't really know i think general it was just general persecution yeah, okay um damn yeah, so by the way, did we say we're in Russia? We're in Russia. I don't know. We're, we're in, in Russia, Russia in the 30s. We're in Russia in the 30s. Of, of the 19s. Yes. Um, and in 1936 was when uh, Karp Lykov's brother was murdered, and this was sort of a last straw for him with Stalin and uh, the Reform and the Bolshevik Party. His name is really Karp, huh? Karp, K-A-R-P, Karp. Huh. Mm-hmm. 
Karp Blykov. It sounds good. It actually. sounds great. It's yeah. it's a pretty badass name if yeah. you think about it. If you don't think about him like being a fish, it's a great name. <laughs> Not a very. I am I am strong. Uh, I am strong opposition to Stalin. I am fish man. Um, so Carp and his wife Akulina decide last straw. We are getting the fuck out of Dodge, and they take their two children at the time, Savin and Natalia. Out into the goddamned wilderness. Mm-hmm. So the Lykov family, the four of them together, their uh, their children at the time were like young. Uh, one of them was two. The other was nine. nine. Yeah. Uh, they take a nine year old, a two year old, a relatively limited set of belongings. Uh, they took some clothing, some cold weather clothing, uh, some food, some seeds. Um, a they loom? brought a spinning wheel. Yeah, a yeah. loom. Uh, well, for, they were gonna have to make their own clothes. They were, um, because they were they weren't just getting out of dodge. Like we're gonna go, um, we're gonna go wait this out for a couple years. It was like, they were going fuck full this shit. I'm out. Yeah, like yeah. I'm. We're done now. With Forever. Civilized, quote unquote, civilized or industrialized, uh, the industrialized world. So they legit start going directly into. It's called the taiga. Taiga. Yes. Not uh, Tiger with a British accent. Tiger. T-A-I-G-A. And definitely not the rapper. Definitely never the rapper. Um, the Tiger is the name for the Siberian coniferous forests that are sort of at the, I don't even know what the uh, the latitude is specifically, but... Is, is the, is the Tiger specific to that region or is it like a type of climate my understanding is at that latitude worldwide is the taiga style climate Hmm. the sometimes swampy coniferous forest of high northern latitudes especially that between the tundra of siberia and north america okay so yeah tundra and steppes of siberia and north america sorry okay so So yeah it is a a band around the northernmost part of our planet Mm, maybe not northern most, no, but sorry, way up there. But up there. Yeah. Um, so they were going out into the forest in Siberia. Yeah, for forever. sure. Forever. That was the plan anyway. Um, hell of a plan. Hell of a plan. Mm-hmm. Hell of a plan to j- just legit be like, you know what? Fuck this and fuck it forever. Not going to another civilization, not trying to leave the country. Nope. Just trying to go where we'll never be found. So that's what they embark upon. Actually, um, they didn't do their trip all at once because it would have been quite hard. The closest city to where they eventually set up shop is a city called Abakan in the Republic of Kakassia. Um, uh, Abakan is a city of about 170,000 people where the Lykovs eventually set up their camp, if you will. Uh, their homestead uh, is about 160 miles into the tundra from there. So Oof. not fucking close, even a little bit. To get there took them like a couple of years though, didn't it? Yeah. So like they, they actually had smaller temporary right. camp or camps on the way. Yep. They, I, I, and I'd be really curious to know. I don't think, well, in my research, I didn't find anything on this, but I'd be super curious to know if it was originally the intention to, uh, to only go so far out and then they're like, maybe they saw hikers or hunters or fishermen or whatever. And they were like, Nope, fuck this, not far enough. And then they moved again and they still found people. So they kept going further and further and further until they were like, okay, we are finally far enough away that we don't see people or haven't seen people in years. So this is good enough. Mm -hmm. Or whether they genuinely started with that plan of like, we're going to live here for a year. And then I don't know. I don't know how you would though. Like, how would you know what that destination was like until you were there? That's a good I, I point. I think it would have to be like, does this place work? Let's try it out for a few months. That's a good point. No, it doesn't work. Let's keep moving. There's yeah. not enough food or we don't have enough fresh water or right. the weather is especially shitty or whatever. Right, right. And boy, is the weather especially shitty. Did you do some actual like climate research? Oh yeah. Okay. What it's are we, what su- are we dealing with? It sucks real bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're talking about regular winter temperatures of 30 below. Mm, Like daytime temperatures. Uh, I think so, yes. Yuck. Um, Ah. We're talking real short days, not a lot of sunlight because you're you're far enough north that you get a lot of darkness in the wintertime. Mm, Yep. Um, 
we're also talking like you do have a summer. I mean, the snow does melt in the summer, but it's really short, which makes your growing season for food extremely short. Yeah. One year their crops all died because it snowed in June. We're going to get there. Um, <laughs> but yes, that's a super, super good indicator of how fucked the weather was here. It There was a winter snowstorm in June mm-hmm. that fucked their whole shit up. So um, that gives you some idea of how short that uh, their their um, their summers were. Um, do we so, want to do we want to work backwards on this or uh, how do you how do you want to go through this this next few decades? Um Oh, I think we should go forwards. Okay. So as far as we know, in like 38 or 39 is when the Lykov family settled at their, I guess what we would call permanent settlement, which was on the shores of the Abakan River. Um, speaking of, hey, we need a lot of fresh water. Um, they were on a relatively sizable river that is traversable. Yeah, Traversable is a... Um, is a loaded term. It's traversable if you currently have like chainsaws and canoes and shit because there's so much snow and shitty weather that often trees fall over the river. So mm. to traverse it like in current times, you literally have to take a chainsaw with you and canoe or boat up to the trees, saw them in half so they fall down the river and then keep going. Wait, what? The river runs into civilization, but to go up the river to the destination that the Lykovs actually were Mm -hmm. today, that's the only way to do it because there's so many trees that fall throughout the course of each season. Oh, so the river is blocked by fallen trees? Basically, yes. So you have to have a chainsaw in your canoe Uh, or your boat? It. Yes, like not not perpetually, but basically enough trees fall every year that it's a it's fucked up to travel. It's not like people are just generally. Got doing it. this regularly up they and were down on foot, for though, fun. Correct? They were uh they were on foot. They were yeah. on foot. If you were to canoe there from like basically civilization to get there, it's about a seven day canoe trip. Jeez. And in the wintertime Or you know, just like a four year hike. Or a four year hike, <laughs> yes. Uh or in the wintertime it's the Lykov camp is again today. Uh, only accessible by helicopter. There's no, yeah. There's literally no way to get there in the winter time. The river um, freezes over. I'm assuming river freezes over. Yeah. There's some rumors of a snowmobile Yeti? track. Ah, <laughs> Yeti? Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Are we gonna do it? <laughs> um, no, a, a snowmobile track that could potentially get you there. And again, roughly like seven to ten days. But apparently, it's like super treacherous. And there's super. How do you how do you do that when it's also thirty below? Take a snowmobile. Or how do you go anywhere on foot when it's 30 below? Well, they wore a lot of clothes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I get it. But they work in those I temperatures. I would for sure die. Worked in those temperatures. Um, yeah. Well, think, some of them did. I think we should jump ahead to why we know any of this. And then um, work our way back. Okay, that's fair. Uh, can we, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me, let's at least say the family grew. Okay. Two more kids were had uh, in the years following their permanent settlement. Uh, there is a younger daughter that is born. Her name is Agafia. She was born in 1944, so about eight years after they have fully pulled the ripcord on civilization. Uh, and Dimitri, her older brother, who was born in 1940, so about four years uh, after they had pulled the ripcord on civilization. So, Carp, Akalina. Uh, mom and dad, and then Savin, Natalia, Dimitri, and Agafia, the four children, all live in this one encampment alone, undiscovered, and alive, except for mom. For 42-ish years. For 42 years. No one had any idea where they were or that they existed. Yes. Uh, in 1970. Eight. Uh, eight, thank you. In 1978, a group of iron ore exploring geologists, prospectors, sorry. prospectors, uh, are in a helicopter surveying the Siberian wilderness, where most of Russia's natural resources are. Yes, and I had to do a had to jog the old memory of how fucking big and vast Siberia is. Mm. Holy fuck. It's yeah. humongous. Are we sure we're not pulling the Greenland and it just looks big on maps, though? No. Did we get a, a an actual area this time? Uh, I didn't, mm. but I know it's fucking humongous. Hey, Google, how big is Siberia? 
Yeah, yeah let's let's do that so we don't get angry emails. They weren't <laughs> no, angry. No one was angry. They were kind emails. I'm just uh, five. Roughly 5 million square miles. 5 million <laughs> square miles. And the photo that Google shows you is just a pit of ice. Sick. L- literally, a, it's a person. I can't even tell. Hello. I think it's a person. It might be a bear. Hello. Standing next to a, <laughs> an, a bear. an ice crater. Hello, please welcome to our 5 million <laughs> square mile chunk of ice. <laughs> it is beautiful. That's what Google would add, if you believe. It actually is quite beautiful. Um, there's some really great documentaries out there uh, that you can watch. In other, Sorry, in other Go words, ahead. that is 10% of the Earth's land surface. Okay, so and sev- that's not a stat I saw, but that's buck-fucking-wild. And 77% of Russia's total territory. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it's actually real big. Real, real big. Mm, and okay. also, I think for the vast majority, uninhabited. By, like, a lot uninhabited. Uh, yeah. Like, I know there are some small-ish, like, 100 to 200,000 person cities around Siberia, but the connective tissue in between is super unforgiving. So it's frozen mountains. Seventy-seven percent of the, of Russia's land area, but only twenty-seven percent of the population. Okay, so there you go. Yeah. That's damn. You got some great stats very quickly. I googled. Well played. It. How big is Siberia? <laughs> God damn, Google <laughs> carrying the weight on that yeah, one. Yeah, they're like, this I, is what you actually meant. I can't take too much credit for that. <laughs> um. So in in 78, these four uh, iron ore geologists, prospectors, are flying a helicopter uh, over the area, over the Akaban River, and they see what they realize is human interference with the land. It's um, I saw a clearing, basically. A that clearing. didn't look natural. Trees down. They also saw um, like trenches dug, which I think is probably maybe where they would like farm, or maybe even yeah. where they had dug in for their um, their home. Yeah, I think they had seen <clears throat> the gardens first. Got it. Which was a pretty good sign that humans were doing something in right. the area. It's like enforced nature that wouldn't happen without. As far as I know, no other animals uh, tend to crops. Tend, crop tend. <laughs> yes. Damn, we would be in trouble if that <laughs> starts happening. Um, so they find a clearing and get out because, to their knowledge, this is not inhabited land. It shouldn't be inhabited. They're 160 miles from the most populous, closest city. And when they walk upon this clearing, they see a few very small buildings and a cleared garden area. And they approach the house door. And, uh, I think they took their time making that decision, though. Yes, true. They did. It wasn't like a they didn't run up and knock, knock. Well, and I think there also had to be some communication with the uh, company or organization uh, on whom's behalf they were there. Oh, really? I missed that part. Yeah, because I, I think they saw it from the air, called back to whoever they were working for and said... Um, what do we do with this? Should we check it out? Should we leave it alone? Because yeah. I mean, it's all the stuff that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. With we, you don't know who those people are. Maybe they're indigenous to the area. Maybe you're interfering in any variety, multitude of ways. Right. And also, it might not be the safest thing for your own person. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that could be a pretty hostile situation pretty quickly. Right. So, yeah, they. I think they saw it originally from the air and then actually approached like a few days later, I think. Okay. So they were, they were biding their time and investigating and like trying to figure this thing out. Well, Cause they also got gifts in the meantime, they brought them food and like animals to make sure that they would be, uh, kindly in their yeah. interaction. Um, I think this might be a good time to read the, uh, Pismanskaya quote. Sure. Um, so one of the, I guess the lead geologist who was uh, there to help survey for iron ore is Galina Pismanskaya, I think, um, who they actually kept journals, I think. This came from a journal that she wrote. Yeah. And uh, it, it's her recounting their initial interaction with the Lykov family. And she says, beside a stream, there was a dwelling Blackened by time and rain, the hut was piled up on all sides with taiga rubbish. 
bark, poles, planks. If it hadn't been there for a if, excuse me, if it hadn't been for a window the size of my backpack pocket, it would have been hard to believe that people lived there. But they did, no doubt about it. Our arrival had been noticed as we could see. The low door creaked and the figure of a very old man emerged into the light of day, straight out of a fairy tale, barefoot, wearing a patched and repatched shirt made of sacking. He wore trousers of the same material also in patches and had an uncombed beard. His hair was disheveled. He looked frightened and was very attentive. We had to say something, so I began, Greetings, Grandfather. We've come to visit. <laughs> the old man did not apply immediately. Finally, we heard a soft, uncertain voice say, Well, since you traveled this far, you might as well come in. Pretty good start that dude understands the language you're speaking and can respond to you. Yeah. That's better than that we've, could have gone. We've are, and, and didn't come at you with, uh, no weapons. with a weapon drawn. Yeah. So they actually went into the house. Yes. And had some interactions with the family. Didn't go so good. Uh, they, they went into the house and then they went out of the house yeah. pretty quickly. So they described the house as being, or the cabin, I guess. It was a, a log cabin, basically. Uh, it's like something from the Middle Ages. And it looked like it was built from whatever they could find. Yep. Um, so it was not much more than a burrow, sort of a a log kennel that was as cold as a cellar from, yeah. I'm, I think that's from that same journal. Yeah. Um, the floor was like dirt and scraps and food things and disgusting. Yeah. Uh, and they had that one window that let in a little bit of light and then they had a wood burning stove for heat, but that also supplied some light. Which... And the whole thing was just one room where all... Five? Six? Six. Be five at the time because, unfortunately, Mama Lykov had passed right. before the geologist came. But at one point, six people had lived in that one room. Yes. Five were currently living there. Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. There was a period of time where the elder boys had been sent away to live on their own and created some other hut at some point. Mm. We don't entirely know how many years or how long that was for. And I don't know if the brothers were living with them at the time. The way that I understand the story was it was actually just the dad and the girls who were in there when the geologist came, but that the brothers were like not so far away. Like the, the brothers did interact with the geologist. I just meant more so that at some at one point, point, six yeah, people yeah. were living in yes. one one room. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, the the reason that this interaction did not ultimately go very well is that the two is the two girls, right? Yep. Had literally never seen a human being that was not their sibling or their parent. Yeah, I mean Natalia was two at the time when they left, so would basically have no functional memory. Right, but I mean we're talking about people in their forties. Yes. Like full grown adults who had never interacted with a human being who wasn't part of their immediate family. Completely. I'm I'm just saying uh, Agafia was born out there, so had like literally never anybody. Yeah. And Natalia yeah, yeah, yeah. was born in civilization, but has no functional memory. Right. And at the time, Natalia was born in thirty four. So in and they left in thirty six, and this was seventy eight. So she would have been she would have been forty four. Yeah. And Agafia was born in nineteen forty four, so would have been thirty two. Thirty four. Yeah, seventy eight. Thirty four. So yeah, 34 years of never seeing another person. Needless to say, they were a little bit freaked out. Yeah. Not only I'll, had they not seen people, but they had not seen any concept of modern technology that had yeah. evolved in the time since they had departed civilization. Well, not just in that time, never. Never. Yes, good they point. Didn't, they didn't know what a radio was, what a car was, what a... I mean, they they had probably heard of these things, I yeah. guess, but they had never experienced any of that firsthand. Right. A helicopter was probably... Helicopters could not have been invented in 1936, could they? Yeah, probably. Think so? Yeah. I'm sure the military was doing things by then. Yeah, that's a good point. When was... Da Vinci the... was drawing them in the, in the, the way back. Yeah, in the way back. Yeah, you're right. That was probably stupid of me. Carry on. I don't know. Oh, well... Around then, probably. First practical helicopter was September fourth of nineteen. Excuse me, September fourteenth of nineteen thirty nine. Okay. So but anyway, 
all of this would have been extremely new and extremely fucking terrifying. Scary, probably. <laughs> yeah. And then on top of that, they have their religious context. The only texts that they'd ever had access to were the Bible and other religious texts yeah. that they learned to read and write by reading and writing scripture. And so their initial reaction was that this was uh, some sort of punishment from God. The devil, a demon, mm-hmm. uh, someone there to hurt them, capture them. So they enter this house and they hear two women screaming, this is for our sins. This is for our sins. Yeah, we're going to see ourselves out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? They, uh, we're going to go. They Grandpa Simpson their ass right back out the door. Yeah. Boop, boop, but boop, boop, boop. decided to like a few yards from the house, sit down and eat lunch. Yeah. I guess as a sign of like, uh, we're here if you want to try that again yeah. and we're not trying to hurt you or take anything from you. Right. Also, we have food, if that's interesting to y'all. Do y'all fuck with food out right. here? It seems or like nah. that might be limited and, and we have an abundance. So, Intentionally. Yeah. Like brought y'all in abundance. So after about half an hour, the family came out again to, or came out to talk to the the geologists again, which uh, seems like it went a little better. Yeah. I got the impression that maybe dad was like, hey, this is okay. Mm-hmm. I've met people before. <laughs> right. Although 40 years ago. Right. Yeah. Been a, been a hot second, but, you know, I I understand the concept. Like, Human beings are okay. Right. Don't freak out. Sometimes. Sometimes. They did, for what it's worth, I mean, they were... Um, they were also repellent towards other human beings, not just through like their general religious, like, oh, that's a demon or whatever, but also because last they left, they were under pretty intense persecution. Right. And without getting any sort of update to that, they had no idea how long that lasted or how bad that got. Right. Or you I mean, you're probably operating on the principle of other people are bad. Yeah, for sure. We are out here isolated for a reason. Yep. We don't want to interact with other people. If right. people show up knocking on the door, it's probably not good. Yes. And spending all our days and nights, I mean, praying and singing and um, enacting all their old rituals, like daily religious rituals, like that's how deep they were in their beliefs. So even like very basic things were totally foreign to them. Like they had never seen bread. Yeah. Which, well, because they they didn't bake, they didn't have a way to bake things. They didn't have. I mean, I, I guess they could have like harvested put grain it in a pan and yeah. Well, at the time that they were found in seventy eight, a lot of their ability to cook had deteriorated because they brought utensils and pots and stuff with them. But over forty years, they were no longer usable. They had rusted. They had fallen apart. Right. And they didn't have a way to, you know mine and smith metal goods no yeah so they basically were not cooking it sounded like which i'm i'm like slightly confused about like i don't know i guess there are other in my opinion there are other ways to cook things that don't necessarily involve metal pans i mean i get that it makes it harder to like boil water and you know all that but um i don't know i guess there's some ways that you can do it but i get that yeah it It definitely makes it a lot harder I just would be a creative motherfucker if I was starving to death. Would you, or would you eat whatever you could eat fastest and most easily? I mean, I don't know. And with uh, and while expending the least amount of energy, I guess it depends. Like they, they on were, their mom had literally starved to death. Yeah, but but she starved to death seventeen years earlier. Yeah, I mean, don't you think they got slightly better at like? Doesn't sound like it. Getting food, not particularly. The brothers would haunt a little bit. So. Just real quick to wrap up the yeah, yeah. geologist story. They returned several more times, and a lot of the original information that we had about this was from their conversations with uh, primarily Carp, it sounds like. Yes. Because he had the most um, context, I guess, with, with which to interact with them. He also had the best language because apparently the daughter's... Uh, 
and the son who was raised in the wilderness spoke a mixture, like a bilingual mixture of Russian and some sort of old, uh, like historical dialect of Russian, I believe. I saw it described a few different ways. And like some of the original reports say that it was basically unintelligible and that it was almost like a, not even it, not language, more like a cooing or humming or like, um, verbalizations, but not necessarily language, which I, I, which I, I read that too, but, um, I, I feel like that's kind of strange because we'll get into it later, but, um, one of the Lykov family is still alive and she's been interviewed on camera and she speaks, I mean, she speaks Russian, like she speaks in a way that it can be translated and people who speak Russian can interact with her. Yeah. So maybe if they didn't understand the old world language that they were maybe kind of going in and out of, maybe it seemed more unintelligible than it really was. I don't really she, know. It's uh, Agafia, right? It's the one Agafia who's still is alive. The, yeah. She's also since then had somewhat extensive interactions with the, the outside public, world. Yeah. So maybe that's changed over time too. I guess. Yeah. I, I just know. feel like if, you know, if she was 34 at the time, she probably didn't like learn Russian since. I mean, she still lives basically in, in, in complete and total isolation. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Yeah. And they must've had to be able to communicate with their parents, obviously who spoke Russian. Right. Right. So, right. I, yeah. I don't know. That, that was just interesting to me. And like, I'd never considered that the number of people you learn language from would affect how much language you learn, how much or the way that you learn and develop language. For sure. No, that makes sense. And, and also like any sort of, I guess this is the point you're trying to make any, any slight intonation differences or word choice differences get magnified multiple times over in those small environments. So then, yeah, you might not have the greatest language. The stuff that we learned about the family from these interactions and now mm, 30 to 40 more years of on and off interactions. Um, they m- brought clothes with them and made new clothes with the loom and spinning wheel that they brought with them, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, they brought some fabric with, I guess, too. Yeah, I heard that Planning as well. to make new clothes as they were out there. Eventually that ran out, and they <clears throat> they wove fabric out of hemp that they grew, I guess, by the time that they were found in 78. Yeah. So they were like patchwork, piecing together hemp fabric to make clothes and shoes, Patch old clothes. it sounded like. Yeah, patching... Uh Patching old clothes with hemp, creating new shoes with hemp, and then also apparently creating shoes with birch bark, I guess. Okay. Um, Which doesn't sound super comfortable, Mm -hmm. but I don't know. Maybe if you tear it into strips, you can weave with it, or I I don't really know. Uh, When they found them in 78, they were also eating primarily potatoes that they were growing in their garden. Uh, And then they were like smashing and rolling them into potato patties. Yeah. Mixed with hemp, rye, and other seeds and stuff for flavor. And then they would also collect, there were pine nuts and berries that grew in the like immediate vicinity of their camp that they would harvest and eat. Wild mushrooms was another one mm-hmm. that they would go grab and eat. And they, although they didn't have weapons or any like metal tools, they, at least one of the boys did hunt. And they hunted by basically following or like tracking and chasing animals until they would become exhausted and die or just like give up and allow you to take or kill them. Yep. Dude would just go out into the woods. Persistent as shit, man. And say, hey, deer, I'm in better shape than you and I'm going to prove it. It's you and me. I bet your life that I'm in better shape than you. If you lose, I'm going to eat you. I heard it. Let's take the next four days to figure this out. Want a bet? <laughs> I heard. How is it worth expending that much energy? I mean, this ha- it would only make sense with large animals, right? This to, would have to be like at least a deer or like an elk or something. So you could bring back enough to 
Yeah, because you're exhausting yourself for, I'm assuming, days at a time. Right. Plus, plus the trip back from however long a four-day-long journey takes you away. Right. Literally running an animal to death. I'm assuming you're, uh, it's a pretty good distance away from where you started. You're slightly wiped. It's crazy. It's in, it's insane. <laughs> that was, that was one of the wildest parts to me that that, I, that would have never even occurred to me that that was a method of hunting. I heard in one of the articles I read that the older brothers were so adapted to it at a certain point that depending on, uh, the season, they felt that they could, be more effective and faster barefoot. And so yeah. they would do four days that. sometimes when there was snow cover on the ground mm. barefoot and they would sleep on the ground overnight in temperatures that would go to like 40 degrees hmm. and just get back up in the morning in their bare fucking feet and be like, cool, going to go run after this deer <laughs> for another day. Just Wim Hof a deer to death. Just day in and day out. Also, so they evolved, I guess, to handle some of their situation as well. How Not wild evolved, is it just to be mean? able to keep up with a deer? I, Those <laughs> things are fast. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you better wait till you find the oldest deer you can find and be like, all right, you're going to, you're going to be slower than the rest. <laughs> uh, in spite of all of that, they were almost always starving sometimes to death. Um, 1961 was the summer that it snowed in June that we referenced towards the beginning of the show. Right. And a frost killed everything that was growing in their garden. In June. In June. And by the spring of the following year, they were eating their own shoes. Yeah. Not great. This is, I, I'm pulling a lot of this from a, uh, there's a Smithsonian article written in 2013 by Mike Dash, which I think brought a lot of attention to this story a second time yep. after the original uh, discovery of it in 78. Yep. So a lot of the information we're, we're pulling is from there. but A lot of mine, too, is from... Uh, there's a Vice documentary on the family and on, uh, on um, Agafia as well. Okay. The, uh, the written version of that, I think, borrows heavily from that Mike Dash Smithsonian article also. As far as I could tell, that was the f the like first uh, more modern account of this it. This is Smithsonian Magazine? Yeah. Got it. So anyway, in that Smithsonian article, it says they were reduced to eating shoes and bark. And Akalina died of starvation that year in order, or while trying to ensure that her kids had enough to eat. Yeah, the... The, I read it a couple different ways, but one was essentially that she borderline intentionally starved herself to death so that whatever food they were scrounging could be shared amongst the kids and keep the kids alive. They were they were down to a single grain of rye at one point. Their their uh, I guess harvest that year was one grain of rye Jesus. that they guarded around the clock from other animals and from the elements and stuff. And uh, that one sprout gave them 18 grains at the end of the season, and they regrew their entire crop from that one sprout. Wow. They were down to their family's like literal livelihood, depending on a single sprout for a full season. Which also means Damn. that you're just not eating during that time, right? Well, you if you're gouting, if you're guarding a single sprout with your life, you do not have other food. You're eating, you're eating your shoes. Well, I mean, <laughs> like they were to go back to our other stuff. Like they were doing some of the wild mushroom stuff, and they were eating like leaf leaf greens. And also, I saw at one point that they had started to catch some fish when it wasn't frozen over in the river. Yeah, they lived by a river. Yeah, so that's also some sharpen of, a stick and stab a fish. That's kind of what I'm like. Some of these moments of of pure starvation, I'm I'm a little bit um, like, how did it get that bad? But I guess mm -hmm. it's one of those things where we we've talked about this in a couple of couple dire situations on the show in the past about how like it's this kind of fucked up cycle where if you're hungry, then you don't have enough energy to go out and kill stuff or whatever. Well, so then you make those fast choices like you were talking about, but then you eat the stuff around you and you have less energy and then you don't 
you know, and then you kind of spiral into eating less and feeling weaker and eating less and feeling weaker. I wonder if it's a an issue of having such a short season, both for like fishing, you probably have two months, right? Sure. Three months maybe. And then if you don't have a way to like smoke that or store that meat somehow, yeah, you can eat well for three months. Right. But now you have nine months where you don't have anything stored or you're not growing or you can't go out and scavenge the forest for berries and stuff. I mean, your growing season is just so incredibly short. Yeah. And if you don't have a way to store stuff, no matter how much food there is for those three months by May, you're going to be screwed. Right. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then you, you factor in too, you know, in my head, I'm going like, well, why weren't they like doing more fishing or whatever? But like, what are you going to break through the ice with? Right. You have no tools. You don't have tools. You have no metal. I mean, you have the the pots you have that are literally like burnt through, but like, I mean, what are you, you going to sharpen? I mean, I don't know. That That's where my head went was like, do you try to rip a piece of the pot off and like I'm turn sure it they into it? Yeah. But it just wasn't. I mean, wasn't, they were using 50 year old pots. Right. There's think, probably not going to be that much left and they've been storing them in like pretty outdoors temperatures. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I The eating your shoes seems like it has to be a negative ROI though. Yeah. There can't be that many calories in a shoe, and now you don't have shoes. Right. <laughs> you have severely limited your ability to go get more food by eating your own footwear. I believe that's the definition of that old truism, like cutting off your nose to spite your face or whatever. Like, yeah. That's kind of the definition of that. Mm. Also, if you're eating bark, eat more bark. Don't eat your shoes, right? Right, but that's kind of what I mean by the whole... Got to go harvest it. You, you got to. You got to leave. This you is gotta, right here. I'm gonna chew on this because right. it's already on my foot. Right. Mm. Also, uh, bears, wolves. What about them? They exist. Tons apparently in this area of bears. I've and heard wolves. Siberia has some bears. Yeah. Um. Apparently, it was like a lot. So I think. <laughs> I think at a certain point... Google how many bears are in Siberia. I think they might have been a little bit like, uh, hey, it's pretty dark out and pretty cold out, and there's a fuckload of bears out there, and I'm not into it. Hmm. Russia has the largest black bear population in the world. Sick. The brown bears of East Siberia are populous, but nonetheless are considered to be an endangered species as they are still largely treated as a game animal. Oh, dang. Um, That's fucked up. Oh. About 16,000 brown bears in the eastern Siberian taiga. 16,000 brown bears. That's today, though. I bet there were a lot more in the 30s and 40s and 50s. When they were not being uh, treated like a game animal? they were less endangered. I would say, regardless, thousands of bears is too many to feel comfortable. Yes. Mm. Um, mm. So in 1961 is when Akalina died. That left the family to five. Um, unfortunately, just weeks after the geologists visited... Geologists? Geologists. <laughs> they're prospectors out there just, they're and out there geologists. They're geologists around. Ge- geology in their asses <laughs> off. The geologists and prospectors... Uh, prospectists. Left the Lykov family camp. Um... Or I guess I don't know if they had fully departed or whether they were still in that period you were talking about where they were having sort of limited back and forth interactions. I think that was a pretty short period of time. It was like a few weeks, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Because I also, I heard that during that time, the geologists set up some sort of small camp and there had been a time where uh, where Carp and uh, Agafia had watched TV. Yeah, they brought a television set with them, which and is, plugged it into what I didn't had no idea. <laughs> that part seemed weird to me too. A radio, okay, you have like a you know a crank radio or, I, or a battery powered radio. I or guess a, I'm wondering if at that time they had the concept of a gas powered generator that had like AC power, or maybe did uh, was there like a smaller sort of base camp that these prospectors were stationed at and then they would go out for shorter maybe and maybe, and maybe the, they somehow worked their way there at one point yeah or maybe it was one of those like handheld antenna televisions i don't know mm. yeah but that's it seems too early for that 60s i don't know technology yeah. Mm. yeah 60s 70s technology but in any case they had some interaction with them over the course of a few weeks 
saw some of their technology, apparently watched some TV. Carp was not psyched and had a lot of mean things to say about contemporary television, how everyone was going Foosball to hell. Foosball is the devil. Yeah, for, like, for <laughs> sure, for sure, that's totally what it was. Um, Should have pulled some of those. They had some very, uh, shall we say, uh, archaic gender role uh, thoughts oh, yeah, were ex- espoused by Carp. Oh, I didn't catch those. There was a, there was a, apparently the prospectors were watching a concert at some point that had women doing traditional dances, and mm-hmm. he made some comment that they should be not be throwing their skirts in the air. They should be uh, praying and making food in the kitchen and mm. sewing and doing other things. Well, you know what they say, Carp knows best. Carp, <laughs> Carp, Carp did not apparently, and I mean, I don't know, he, he did all right for a while, but... Um, did he? Well, did he? Well. His wife starved to death. She did. She did. Unfortunately, as is the case with these isolated peoples that we have talked about, Dimitri, Natalia, and Savin all succumbed to what we believe was pneumonia in the weeks. Mm, One of them did. One of them. Well, cough, bloody cough, um, sickness, all. Two of them died of kidney failure. Is that what they actually chalked it up to? Two of them died of kidney failure, one from pneumonia. Couldn't kidney failure also be a byproduct, though, of being sick from pneumonia or something They else? thought it was most likely from their, quote, harsh diet, a.k.a. eating their footwear. Um, so the they in this situation is the geologists, and there's an interesting uh, back and forth where the geologists say these people, th- these three died because they were in such bad shape when we found them, and... You know, there wasn't anything we could do to save them. But a lot of outside speculators say that they think that as happens with isolated populations, most of these kids had no antibodies to anything that was a contemporary disease in society. But they were totally immune to bear diseases. Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> no, wait, did you did you actually see that? One no. of them <laughs> What's a bear disease? I was uh, just being a dumbass. Oh, uh, one of them uh one of the um I'm a dumbass. Agafia, who is alive today, uh, Spoiler. is immune to... We already said she's alive today. What the fuck? We already said she's alive. Sorry. I, Ag- don't, I don't listen sometimes. Agafia has been tested for Lyme disease, and she's actually built up antibodies and is immune to Lyme disease because oh. she's been bitten by so many ticks in her lifetime. Cool. That she's just straight up immune to it, which Jeez. is crazy. Um, but that the other children from being in isolation for so long didn't have those same types of immunities that we have in our society today. Because they had literally never seen another person. Never touched another person. So now they're hugging and, or I don't know, I I saw that they shook hands and somewhat embraced. In some sort of contact with. Passing, you know. Sharing some air. Sharing some air, sharing goods. The geologists brought them some goods. Some they refused to take, some they did take. Um, they think that their immune systems were just compromised by outsiders. Well, especially if you're already very weak from being malnourished totally. for year, your whole life. And right. You could get the smallest cough or cold or pneumonia yeah. and it could turn into something disastrous. So, in, unfortunately, that killed uh, three of the five remaining Lykov family members um, and then left, when the geologist departed, left just Agafia and her father, Carp, uh, for the remaining years of uh, Carp's life, he must have been pretty old, right? Uh, when and he even died? In, no, even well, yes, but even in seventy eight. I mean, he, yeah, he, he was already, born in nineteen oh one, so okay. he was seventy seven when they Damn. came. But he died in nineteen eighty eight, so he lived for another. He, he lived for another he decade made it after eighty seven or eighty eight. Eighty seven, yeah. After living more than half of that in the Siberian taiga? Mm-hmm. 27 Damn. years actually to the day that his wife died, which was kind of interesting. Mm. Okay, so Agafia, as far as we know, for sure as of 2016, still alive. Yeah, so uh, Ag- after her father died, Agafia uh, started being visited a little bit more. Actually, one of the geologists who... Uh, first met them in the 1978 interaction, decided to come, well, originally he was going to come help uh, and built a cabin down the hill from the Lykov family 
uh, camp. I didn't understand that. Which part? So the idea was that she was in her 70s and needed help with like the physical labor aspects of living in isolation right. the way that she does. Right. And he had a familiarity with the family in the area and wanted to abandon society as well. Yeah, but he's also in his 70s and has one leg. Well, he didn't have one leg at the time. Really? Yeah, he had two legs when he first moved out there. Oh, that makes a little more sense. But apparently over time, he he it's basically had some sort of... Um, gangrene. Yeah, I think actually he, he had... I do remember reading this now. Slowly, basically his foot uh, was needed to be amputated. So he got helicoptered to society, had his leg amputated, and then came back, got which it. is... Which is kind of a buck fucking wild choice as well, because to go back. To go back. I mean, he goes, yeah. "Oh, I'm I'm here, I'm here to help you." You know, he he had only lived in the in the wilderness with Agafia for I don't know, not with, but near her for like it was but, like seven to ten years before. By with we mean in another cabin ten miles away, but yes, they interacted sometimes. They inter- or not, yeah, and he moved closer eventually at one point, like I a walkable difference, a walkable distance from uh, from her. But anyway, um, yeah, no, he he only had one leg, so I just don't understand why you would go. This is the harshest conditions ever. I can't hunt. I can't fish. I can't really must garden. Have. No, Agafia took care of him. What? Yes, that is the opposite of what they were trying to do. Correct. She actually talks mm. about it. So there's, I've watched a couple different documentaries on this. There's multiple. The Vice one is really good. I highly recommend it. Uh, Russia Today did a documentary around the same time as the Vice documentary. Um, she does get visitors. People come up the river or helicopter in. They bring her certain goods on her wish list in exchange for interacting with her, asking her questions, etc. The uh, the She's Vice got some really cute goats. Yeah, the vice group brought her a new goat, uh, an additional goat, uh, which, by the way, man, it really gives you, uh, it gives you so much context around how fucking far into the middle of goddamn nowhere this is when you watch the vice documentary where they throw a goat into like a bale of hay in the back of a like, giant fucking helicopter and they just soar over these snow-capped mountains for hours. This dude... It looks like he's gonna bar- like barf or shit or cry or all of the above. The goat does? No, the dude. One of the dudes working for Vice. He's just oh. sitting on what appears to be some sort of like box of goods goats. that they're bringing with them. <laughs> Big box of goats, <laughs> and he's just sitting there looking at the camera like this is this is this is fucking terrifying. I mean, it would be. Well, they- they're probably also paying him eight bucks an hour, right? And then they land the they land the helicopter, drop these guys off to see Agafia. And then the helicopter just fucking flies away. And he goes, Mm-mm. yeah, we'll have Mm-mm. to radio to them. They they said they'll come again when it's safe. <laughs> and they were like, oh, when is that? And he's like, we think like three to four days, but we don't know. It could be way longer. It depends on the conditions. Because it's super <laughs> dangerous to go out there because of how far away it is. So um, can we, t- we're coming up against the clock here. Kay. Can we real quickly go through how many things changed between 1936 and 1978? Oh boy. Just 78 or all the way to now. Well, Agafia went and explored at least the rest of Russia in the eighties. We do know she left a couple times, not like explored the rest of Russia, rest of Russia. The, the Soviet government took her on a tour of Russia for a month. Okay. Right. I'm, I guess I mean like, she wasn't like living in Russia for years at a time. In no, the but she like saw it and interacted with it, said, yeah, this is dumb. I'm going back to the woods. She did not like it. No, that was not like cars. But so let's, let's stick from 36 to 78 for now. Makes sense. That would be the amount of time that had passed with all of them who had gone out there, whether they had been born out there or born in civilization had had no idea of any inputs from the outside world. Right. Okay. Jesus Christ. They missed all of World War II. Didn't even know it happened. No. The entire thing, they had at least a five-year buffer on the front end and then a fucking 30-year buffer on the back end. I will say fascinating. Uh, well, go ahead. I'll, I'll bring it up when we get closer to it. Well, I mean, that alone is insane. Cra- crazy. Global dynamics have changed forever because of what happened during World War II. Right. 
No clue. Hey, spoiler alert. Um, you guys weren't the ones being persecuted anymore. <laughs> Turns out people made a different choice of who to be fucking evil to. So They missed the entire space race. Uh-huh. Which Russia was heavily involved in. Very much so. The craziest part about that is like Carp says, because they're in the middle of nowhere, it's dark as shit. Mm -hmm. During the winter, they have, I don't know, probably 20 hours of dark every day. Right. He noticed satellites starting in the uh, 60s-ish and had mostly figured out what they were. He was like, oh yeah, I figured we made some sort of like artificial star. Because one day I noticed that the stars were moving faster. And you're like, you know what, Carp? Good enough. Yeah, close, right? Close enough, my dude. I mean, he f he figured out that that was a man-made thing right. that we had intentionally put into the sky. Right. Which is what it is. I, um, yeah, I, I feel like that's pretty insane that he was able to gather that. However, would not accept that humans had been on the moon. That was a step too far and insisted that people were fucking with him. So like, he'd, really, fit right, he'd fit right in around here. <laughs> I, uh, it was a hoax. It was a, it was a hoax. He's, he's like, yeah, I'll watch that documentary. They're right. <laughs> um, Along the lines of World War II, atomic bombs, atomic energy in general, did not exist when they left. Nope. And before they returned, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty had been signed. They missed, like, all of it. They did, however, at one point, figure out that missiles were a real thing. Did they see some? They not only saw some, they are not super far away from a uh, remote Russian airbase mm. that did test missile firings. Okay. And actually, there's a scene in one of the documentaries where Agafia um, basically walks up to this tree stump and starts beating on a hunk of metal that is very obviously a missile turbine that had fallen out of the sky and like crushed itself around a tree. And Whoa. she said that for a semi extended period of time, they would see rockets going like they would see the, the trail of rockets going through the sky and occasionally pieces of metal would fall near or around uh, their encampment so Damn. much so that she she told the documentarians she she was pounding on the one and was like, yeah, there's another one up there and I can show you another one that's blah, blah, blah out there. So, Yikes. So at some point, did I don't she, know. Did she know like what they were or what they were for? I, I think so. Now, I'm, now I'm sure she does. Now she does. I think at the time, I guess I would say maybe not, but I don't know when they actually were falling. Yeah. Part of me is thinking, I don't know, are we talking well, that like would, Cold it, War missiles? Mm, or World War II or, yeah. Maybe World War II. If so, back then, they would have been really young and that shit falling out of the sky out of nowhere would have been super fucking strange and freaky. Right. But maybe Carp had enough knowledge of those things to be able to kind of go, well, it's probably this or whatever. Yeah. There's your metal for some tools, by the way. Yeah, what well, I mean, if you don't have other tools, though, that's going to be really hard to yeah. fashion anything out of. I mean, just rip one chunk of metal off. And With what, though? Your hands? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd try that before I eat my shoes, I'm just saying. <laughs> I have so much energy. I'm going to start ripping rockets apart with my bare hands. Not so much. But also, but... I don't have food and I'm eating my shoes. Uh, they missed like just anything technological. Yeah. It would be one thing to go away for 40 years and come back or, you know, be reintroduced to certain things and be like, oh man, technology progressed in a way that I never thought it would. And right. computers are a thing. And, right. you know, television and all of that. Right. It would be so much crazier to have no idea that those things even existed or have ideas of them like purely as abstract concepts for sure like I, they, they didn't they wouldn't have even known what countries or governments or like anything outside of the you know however many square mile area that they inhabited was yeah they wouldn't even know about other climates they wouldn't know like that the rest of the earth existed yeah, I, I read um I only read in, stories, I guess. Yeah, only through stories. I read I read in one of the articles that Agafia and her sister Natalia had like a conceptual understanding of uh horses 
But that when the geologist oh, yeah. came, they showed him, uh, they showed them a picture of one of them riding a horse, and it was like, "Oh, look, Mama, a steed," and they recognized it from like the biblical word for horses. Was would that have been through just descriptions, or did they have like illustrations or they have photos some, or something? They have some pretty crazy religious books that they had that looked to be slightly illustrated, or at least done in a really um, thorough calligraphy style. Okay. Um, but maybe through descriptions or maybe through drawing, you know, you draw something and show people what something might look like and you recognize it through drawings. I don't know. Crazy. I got one thing to finish out with. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, do it. If you'll allow me, please. So the, um, Agafia Lykov, as Spencer and I were saying is still alive to this day, as far as we know, we think, um, she does have, there was a radio with the geologist who uh, lived out there uh, with her. And so as far as we know, she still does periodic check-ins using that radio with some people in civilization. Um, but we think she's still alive out there. In in one of the interviews in the, I think it was in the Russia Today documentary that I watched, she closes out an interview in a really, really interesting way. And uh, she's smiling and she says, see that mountain? There are houses the size of a mountain on top of it. Huh? See that mountain? She leans up through the window. No, I heard you. What does that mean? So it was in the context of them asking her. Actually, the Russia Today documentary had her write a letter to uh, old believers around the world to just sort of tell them who she was and tell them her story. Mm -hmm. She actually asked for help to see if anyone would come live with her and help her live out her days in this only world she really knows or cares about or loves. Yeah. Um, it was sort of in the context of them asking her questions about that or talking about kind of her place in the world. And at first I thought it was a religious thing, but then there was this really interesting suggestion in one of the other documentaries that the Lykovs might not have been the only family to have done this in the mm. period of, in this period of time and that the Lykov family did escape but they could have potentially gotten others or told others or others could have had the same idea and retreated into the Siberian wilderness and if any of them had gone further or into these more unexplored areas it's possible maybe not likely but possible that they would have remained undiscovered or potentially died in those areas yeah but if you're building uh, how, they wouldn't have had the ability to build huge structures probably on not on top of mountains probably not no but uh but who knows if there were more of these people who lived in uh, yeah. in these types of in these types of conditions i it crossed my mind too that you know the brothers having been sent away to go explore or live in a live in another area uh maybe they had seen someone or something out in the world that um i don't know that that said more of these folks lived in such a crazy way and this might be the only one we know about damn pretty crazy uh thank you all for listening we appreciate you uh if you want to leave us a voicemail 612-246-4614 emails are hi at whatifpodcast.com join the facebook group the reddit subreddit is up and running it's a little <laughs> light but it's running <laughs> and uh, as always if you want a second episode of the show every single week for just five bucks a month you can go to patreon.com slash what if podcast as always we love you guys and we will see you next week See you all didn't happen to do a bunch of drugs, did you?